All right, we live? Yes. Good morning, man. How are you? Doing good. Excited to see you. Good to see you. It's been a long time. Oh, yeah. Uh, let's let people filter into. It's definitely a heavy Google day. I got my Google Analytics mug right here. Well, Google mug with Cookie Monster. I think it's like a limited item now, man. They don't even make it anymore. I never got any good Google mugs. I, I think I'm going to store somewhere, but I'll, <laughs> I'll definitely, definitely find one for you. Um, where are you, by the way? I'm in Seattle. Gotcha. Uh, and I'm out here in the beautiful Bay Area. For anyone that's actually here from the East Coast, hope you guys are doing okay with the fires and the, and the, and the smoke. Um, looks pretty bad. Please stay safe. But thanks, you guys, for joining us. Um, let's actually go to uh, a couple of quick intros here and, you know, why you're, why you're stuck with us. Today is 100% focused on the upcoming migration to Google Analytics 4. I'm sure you might have already guessed that I do know my buddy Charles here. Uh, I'll actually let him go and introduce himself, but we're joined by the wonderful, the legend, uh, Charles Farina from AdSwerve. Um, Charles, go ahead and say hello, man. Yeah, thanks so much, Ash. So it's really great to be here. For those of you who haven't met me before, uh, I've been working with the Google marketing platform specifically on the analytics side for probably about 10 years. I'm currently at AdSwerve, uh, which is one of Google's kind of largest partners specializing mainly in probably the enterprise 360 version. Um, and for the last 10 years, I've, I've really considered myself kind of a subject matter expert in the product. I feel like I know it inside and out. I love talking about it. So I'm here today to share lots of insights, give you tips and tricks, and all sorts of things on what Google's up to with this Google Analytics 4 product. So Absolutely. nice to meet you. What does the head of innovation do, by the way, at AdSwerve? Uh, it's, a, it's a title where I just make up a different title all the time. <laughs> Really what it is, is um, I've been focusing on lots of kind of key initiatives lately. So what's exciting about, I think, our industry today is there's more change, more possibilities and yep. more need for like knowledge in all different areas. So at AdSwerve, I've spearheaded different uh, kind of new areas like our server side practice. Uh, there's something called Ads Data Hub or Data Clean Rooms. There's been lots around privacy and consent and all that. Um, and actually, lately, I've been doing a lot with Adobe. So as part of my innovation role, I just focus on kind of these new next areas for, for our customers. That hurts, man. Um, and I'll tell, you, I'll tell you why that hurts in a minute here, too. For everyone's context, too, my name is Ashish. I uh, currently at a company called Adaptive, where I lead our new business efforts. I uh, spent most of my career, actually, in, at Google, uh, just shy of 15 years, working primarily on measurement, which is where I got to meet and uh, hang out and also co-present with, with Charles across a variety uh, of initiatives. Um, I was part of the team that actually created the first iteration of Google Analytics and previously worked with uh, Urchin On Demand, kind of the, the legacy measurement platforms. But measurement is very near and dear to everything that we do, which is why I'm here. Uh, we're taking data and insight, putting in action with Adaptive, the idea being that as you're spending a lot more money with my friends at Google on the top of the funnel, Adaptive wants to use AI and machine learning to make sure that more of them convert on your actual site. So. Just a quick little blurb as to why I'm here. And, and something that's actually very, very near and dear to me too is the fact that we work off of good data, right? No model's gonna be good if you have bad or incomplete data. And with this upcoming change of Google Analytics, uh, a lot of questions around what's going on and how to actually get ahead of it. So the goal for today is to prompt some of these questions, kind of show you what Google Analytics 4 looks like uh, and really have a live discussion on what you should expect and how to actually make the most out of what's going on next. And, and Ash is selling himself short. Uh, many of you are probably familiar that Google Analytics has an academy or a training uh, to get certified. He's one of the instructors up there with Chris Seiden and some of the other kind of experts at, at Google. So if any of you have taken any of those certifications, you might have seen this guy on some of the videos. So he's definitely a legend in his own right. Different hair now, and that, that's my wife's fault, but I uh, appreciate you saying that, man. Can't stop talking about data and measurement, but Stan, thank you for, for acknowledging Urchin. That makes me feel really happy, too. Um, guys, let, let, let's get into it. Uh, a couple of key reminders, if that's all right. Um, here, here's what we're going to cover today, kind of what is GA4? How do you actually kind of get ahead of it? Um, what are the key things that we want to keep in mind as you migrate from Universal Analytics or Google Analytics 3 onto GA4? We'll kind of show it to you and uh, and show you where things might have moved and more more importantly address the methodology behind this overall change and then have open discussion right um uh, a couple of other key things though is ask your questions i see the chat lighting up uh thank you for that 
Um, please ask your questions live. We'll, we'll triage and make sure that they are addressed. Uh, this is being recorded, so after it's done, we'll definitely send it out. Uh, and at any time, you can always reach us. We'll kind of flash our contact info at the very end as well. Sound good? Let's do it. All right, let's do it. Look, I had to ask this question up front, man. Uh, talk to a lot of customers, talk to a lot of friends, a lot of prospects, partners in the industry. And the same question keeps coming up being like, hey, do you need, do you, any friends on analytics still? Like, what's going on here? This is kind of giving some, some heartburn and anxiety. So at a macro level, Charles, what is GA4 and why is everyone freaking out about it? Yeah, so what's exciting uh, towards the probably middle of our time today, I'm going to go through and show some live examples and I think really some features that all of you can get excited about that we've never had before in Google Analytics. Um, but taking like a big step back, what a lot of people don't realize is Google Analytics has been around for 15 years, I think. Mm -hmm. So we saw that uh, comment about Urchin. That's when Google bought Urchin, which was a server side processing tool with logs, turned it into the easy client side solution we know today. But what's fun about that Urchin comment is if you used the very first JavaScript, the urchin.js snippet, it still works today. And Google Analytics still successfully processes data from it. I don't personally know any other software that I use that accepts 15 year old like code or the version from 15 years ago. So it kind of shows the longevity and also how long the core of Google Analytics has really kind of been the same. So that's been a blessing, but also at the same time, a bit of a detriment because for many of us as kind of experts or, or more advanced users or even beginner users, mm -hmm. there's a variety of things around Google Analytics that we probably all wish worked a little bit better. So a simple example, which we'll talk about later is funnels. There's actually no funnel tool or capability that you'd ever want to use in the free version or, or universal analytics. There's just no good funnel kind of report. So with that, really Google Analytics 4 is the first time ever that Google's taken a big step back. They've rebuilt the products from the ground up. They're actually using the core of Firebase Analytics and added some web components and turned it into GA4, but it's a new event model, it's new capabilities, it's new schemas, it's new features, everything about it is new. And why is everyone freaking out? Well, obviously when you've been using something for 15 years and you're forced to learn something new from the ground up, that's inevitably not gonna make uh, a lot of people probably very happy. So sure. uh, Google a lot of credit. Um, they're working on adding a lot of really exciting features and functionality to hopefully make it easier to switch, to think about it differently and add those capabilities we, we've never had before. Um, but that's kind of the gist. Fair enough, man. Especially with the urchin throwbacks there, you're definitely dating me a little bit. I'm definitely not in my 20s anymore, but it was a good time to see the transformation of a, a log-based methodology versus the the the, the GA that, that we all know and love today. I, I think I still have some urchin 7 licenses. <laughs> Maybe we can give those away as a giveaway. So if anyone still wants to use the old version, we can just give you an urchin 7 license, but we'll, we'll think about that for the end. Also, fun fact, the U and UTM for all your kind of tags here stands for urchin. So everyone likes a throwback. Everyone likes a classic. So um, I appreciate that, man. Now, is it fair to say, by the way, that a lot of the heartburn for this migration is coming from the fact that the tag might be different too? Is that accurate? Yeah, I, I would just say everything is different. So when you log in and you look at both platforms side by side, it might feel the same because the color palette, some of the reports might yeah. feel familiar. But if you just look any bit closer, everything about it's different. The tags are different. Um, so that's why everyone's had to retag. It doesn't carry the data forward. And then also the way we do analysis, the way we use reports, everything about it is different. So, I mean, to just to be very transparent, I feel like this is an area for Google to improve. Sure. I think universal was very accessible. Like you could put a person inside universal and if it was the first time they could generally find their way around and, yeah. and, and get some kind of key insights. GA4, it feels like has a much steeper learning curve right now, where the first time you experience it, like things aren't necessarily as familiar or as kind of self-guiding as it was. So I gotta, I gotta, I mean, we just gotta remember I, Google's like three, three-ish years into this journey. 
Universal also had a ton of refreshes. The UI changed. It, it actually used to be a joke where every time you do a training or you talk about it, you refresh and all of a sudden things would look completely different. So yeah. my hope is, is that GA4 starts to get a little bit of that as well. Sure. Where we get some major refreshes to the UI, so new reports, and we get into uh, how to use it. That happened live, by the way, multiple times while I was at Google demoing our newest version of Universal Analytics to an end customer. I, I think I did this with you a couple of times on stage too, Charles. It was just change on me immediately, right? Which is great. It just kind of showed the speed at which we were pushing and developing the platform at the time, but wildly maddening from a client-facing point of view too. That's why I'm like a seasoned pro now at these demos and webinars, because you could throw anything at me and <laughs> I'm, I'll, I'll be like, oh, this is normal. Hey, there's also a reason why I have a bottle of Glenfiddich behind me for the exact same there you exactly. go. Good reason. Charles, I did have a question, by the way, from a, a friend of mine that texted me this morning. How does this change kind of address the, the this notion of the future, right? I've seen a lot of you know marketing from Google around GA4 preps you for the future, the new world, the cookie-less world as it is. What does GA4 do to really kind of ensure user privacy but still have you know meaningful metrics for yeah. customers and store owners and all that fun stuff? The cookie-less future that still Maybe. uses cookies. So <laughs> Um, at a, I, I'm going to give Google massive credit here. So all of us as marketers are dealing with challenges around privacy and consent and technology changes where browsers aren't letting us do things the same way we did a few years ago. Sure. And, and as a simple example, consent is a really challenging component. If any of you have, been, have uh, uh, operations in Europe, part of GDPR means you're supposed to ask consent before you track people. And that's starting to happen in the US, in California and other states with privacy laws that are regional. And what normally happens is when you implement consent, your Google Analytics data, as an example, will all of a sudden drop by like 50% overnight. And a lot of MarTech, all, basically all your MarTech solutions have the same problem where you just lose all this visibility. To my knowledge, Google is the only MarTech provider right now that has a proposed solution to help you with this challenge. And that's related to their consent and uh, uh, behavioral modeling feature, where basically what it does is it captures uh, anonymous data. So it'll capture all the page views, all the events, and some of those will have the IDs where the users consent, and some of them won't where they opt out. And then what happens is Google basically uses machine learning and modeling to try and restore what the behavior and attribution and pathing would look like had everyone opted in. So this is a huge feature and component of GA4. It's, it's new to a lot of people working with model data instead of like the actual deterministic data. Yeah. So that is Google's solution for kind of dealing with this cookie-less feature. And to my knowledge, like Amplitude or Adobe or Marketo, like whatever we would talk about, there's not a lot of other uh, solutions yet other than Google that have something to help in this space. Yeah, totally fair. And everyone, this is kind of, you know, that, that kind of underlying uh, statement right there too, right? Which is given the fact that this is a fundamental change to ensure that everything's actually being abided by the proper way, you're still getting meaningful data while still abiding by regulations. This is why it is kind of a massive shift in the way you actually tag and structure how you measure across your entire site. Now, the good news is this is going to set you up for success in the future, right? Once you actually make that initial effort and do it right and ensure that it's all kind of tracking the way it should, you should be good to go and actually allow for scale going forward. So a little bit of pain right now, but a longer term, uh, bigger payoff from our friends uh, back on the, on the Google Analytics team. But with that, though, can we see it? What do you think, Charles? Let's have some fun. What, yeah. what if uh, we spend some time and I talk about, I think, some of my favorite features that are different in GA4 than Universal. And we kind of explore some of the possibilities around how you can do things extremely different than we've ever been able to do before. That sounds good. good. Sounds great. All right, let's have some fun. So I'm going to share my screen. I've got access to all sorts of demo accounts in Google Analytics. I'm going to start off with the official GA demo account. I might switch to my own adsverb.com instance where I have admin access. So uh, I'll, I'll, I'll be navigating around. Uh, if any of you have never used GA4 before, there's an actual free demo account. Just Google Google demo account um, and you'll find it. It's, a, it's the merchandise store for Google. Now, to start off with, 
as I mentioned, the first time you use Google Analytics 4, you're going to quickly realize kind of everything about it's different. And the first kind of thing I want to highlight is it still has a lot of the same components, right? We have page views, we have events, we have conversions. Um, but outside of that, a lot of what we're looking at is actually going to be very different in GA4 than Universal. And I'm going to start with something basic like conversions. So conversions is something in Google Analytics that if you really think about it, they never really made sense. And why did they not make sense? Well, a conversion in Google Analytics in Universal was sessionized. It could only increment once per session. So if you had something like a purchase or um, something like an add to cart or uh, even watching a video for non-e-commerce, it would only increment once per session, right? But if you had someone that purchased multiple times, you want to see that multiple times. Um, but it never, it never offered more than that in that 15 year history of, of Google. Additionally, for anyone that's been using Google Analytics for a long time, we only ever had 20 of them and you couldn't reuse them. The data recorded was permanent. There was no real way to archive or reuse those. And lastly, they were also kind of basic. I like the word basic. They're basic, meaning you could have an event be a conversion or a page you be a conversion, but you couldn't mix different kind of filters and dimensions. As an example, let's say I wanted a conversion to have a qualified conversion. Maybe I, I only operate in California, so I only want a conversion for anyone that converts in California or the US or a region. Or if I'm e-commerce, I'd like a conversion for anyone that purchased $100 or more product as a high value spender. So let's talk about how conversions actually work in GA4. And I'm going to switch to my account real quick to show this. Um, but in GA4, they've been completely rebuilt. So when we set up these conversions, first of all, you get 30. So we get 10 more than universal. Secondly, you can archive these. So let's say I don't want a conversion. I don't need it anymore. I just turn it off and it frees up a new slot for me to use. And this is actually incredibly important because now we can do seasonal and campaign based goals. Let's say you're an advertiser and you do campaigns for back to school or Black Friday or whatever. Google has never really supported kind of seasonal goals or, or windows based off that. But since we can archive and create new goals and it keeps all the data behind it, we can do that. And then lastly, they're extremely more powerful than what we had. So they're pretty easy to set up. Um, any event can be a conversion. So I, I, uh, what I was showing here is um, if we want an event to be a conversion, you just come in. And as an example, pizza time, this looks really important. I'm just going to turn it on as a conversion. So extremely easy to set up. However, we can do incredibly more complex and powerful things. So one of my favorite features in uh, Google has always been the audience builder. So for any of you that are out there, I know how to separate a beginner from an intermediate user. And that's whether or not you know how to build segments and audiences, because that is how you really use Google Analytics effectively. And the audience builder in GA4 has a lot of new features that are a lot more powerful than we had in Universal Analytics. So as an example, I'll show you an audience I have. I have this audience here. And this audience is a sequence. I said, show me anyone that viewed my blog and within 10 minutes, that's what this setting here is, within 10 minutes, they actually went and contacted us. And within here, there's this new feature called audience triggers. So when someone meets these conditions, Google Analytics 4 actually creates an event from that audience. And that might sound strange at first, but because it has this flexibility, I can actually come in and mark this audience event as a conversion. So now any audience or segment you create, you can actually have as a conversion. So that's why all those examples I just gave you, users from the US, people that purchase $50 or more, basically anything you can build as an audience, you can actually set as a conversion. So we can have audience based conversions in GA4. Sure. 
And that opens up all these possibilities that we've never been able to do before in that universal version. So this is an extremely powerful feature. Gotcha. Related to that, um, this actually highlights another, I think, really important uh, improvement in Universal. And to highlight this, I'm going to talk about time. If any of you have ever looked at how Google Analytics kind of used to measure time, that's another feature that never really made sense, right? Time used to be measured between page views or between interactions. So that meant if someone loaded up your home screen, and then they clicked on a screen to your page about pizza, it would just calculate when the click occurred. So if it was 10 minutes later, it would record 10 minutes of time. But the challenge was you had no idea how long they were actually using that page, right? If they just sat there and they were eating pizza and not actually using your page by navigating with it, it would still record 10 minutes of time. So Google and GA4 has upgraded all the time metrics with this new engagement time. So if you look at the definition, it's actually keeping track of when the page is in the foreground and it has focus and then also it's being interacted with. So the concept of time is a lot more interactive. And to highlight another feature related to that, there's this new set of reports in Google Analytics 4 called Explorations. This was something that only was available in GA360, which was that product for most of you that probably would have cost like $150,000 per year. Only those people had access to explorations. And in GA4, Google's actually taken a ton of features from the enterprise version and given them to everyone in the standard free version. And as part of that, they've given explorations. And there's two parts of Google Analytics for, we have reports and we have explorations. Reports are where you basically get quick snapshots or insights of your data. And explorations is where we do all of our ad hoc and advanced analysis. I spend almost all of my time in explorations uh, because I'm doing a lot of that ad hoc and advanced analysis. And in here, there's a lot of really exciting features. Like for the first time ever, we were talking about Ash. There's a funnel builder in Google Analytics. We can mm -hmm. all build funnels. Hooray. The, again, the funnel features in Universal were, were really not great. So within here, it's super simple. You just come in, you pick all your steps. You can create these off anything you want. But there's some really powerful things in here, like you can add time as a component. So if you want to see how much time it takes someone to actually go through a funnel, you just check this time and it adds time directly into the funnel. You can even trend steps over time. So if you had a funnel and you wanted to see, for example, how does that funnel perform over time? You can just select a trended funnel and actually put each step on a graph with the funnel you've created. So there's a super kind of powerful set of uh, components in here. But where was I going? Oh, what I wanted to show was this uh, segment builder. So the segment builder, you got me all excited. So I wanted to kind of tie this all together. So in the segment builder, let's say we wanted to build like a simple segment. I could say, I want to look at anyone, for example, that saw a certain page on my site. So I could say, uh, show me anyone that viewed any of my blog pages. Oops, uh, blog, I can hit apply. And then I can make this a sequence step. So add a sequence to include. So let me actually change this. So step one is page location contains blog. And then we have that contact example, right? We wanted to see how many of those, for example, got to our contact page. So I can add a second page location and say, show me contact. So this is something we could have done in the old version of Google Analytics. Right. But in here, this time component is my favorite part because we can add these time constraints, right? Show me anyone that did this within a certain amount of time. And that can be days, minutes, seconds, hours. So if I wanted to do it within seven minutes, I can actually apply those constraints. So an example, I think, to make this uh, real is previously in Google Analytics, if you asked uh, Ash or I to do some analysis like on your e-commerce funnel, 
how many people checked out in 10 minutes or less or 10 minutes or more, you wouldn't be able to do that analysis inside GA. There's just no good way to do that. But because time has been rebuilt and added into a lot of the base functionality, we can yep. do all this analysis around time that we could never do before. So this highlights, I think, two of my favorite features. We've got funnels, we've got time, and then also the rebuilt conversions and the power that shows starts Incredible. to showcase some of that functionality. Charles, one thing I'm seeing a lot here is the word events sprinkled across this entire platform, right? Can we talk a little bit around the shift from sessions to events and why that's so important? And the reason I'm asking is that I'm trying to work back to tactically, I love this, this whole group to kind of get away with why it's important to make the migration now and also how to do it. But let's start with events versus sessions. Yeah, so in the universal version, the old version of Google Analytics, there is what we used to call hits. So the way you would track a page view, which was one hit type, mm -hmm. and an event, which was another hit type, was very different. And what I mean by that is they had different schemas. You actually use different tags to set them up. And the scope of them was very different and actually created some challenges for more advanced users. And the classic challenge was you couldn't mix like a page and you couldn't mix it with like session scoped um, dimensions. So as an example, if you mixed page and you wanted to look at transactions by page, those components don't mix because the scoping doesn't allow them to come together. And in fact, sometimes the UI, the interface would let you do it, but the data would actually be very misleading and incorrect. Sure. And it was one of these edge or gotcha cases. So gotcha. what is an event in GA4? Well, events basically power everything. So the best way to think about it is everything is an event in Google Analytics 4. Even a page view is just a type of, a, of an event. So this unifies all of the data that we track in GA4 into kind of one universal schema. And this is why we can actually start mixing things together that we were never able to do before. So if I go as an example to my pages report and I scroll to the right, there's a conversions column here. Conversions and pages didn't go together in Universal. You couldn't mix those dimensions and have accurate data, but because we have this new schema, that's possible. So that's the benefit. The other benefit for implementation is we just have one kind of tag that we use and it's an event tag. And that event tag has all these attributes. So it should make tracking a lot easier. And it also makes the analysis a lot easier because it solves a lot of the scoping issues that we had in the totally. old version. Totally fair. Um, now, one thing I did want to call out and apologies, I'm going a bit off script here because I know that we're saving Q&A for a much more structured session. But I got this question a lot too in the last couple of weeks which is fundamentally, given the fact that Google Analytics is now tracking things differently with events versus sessions, a lot of folks are seeing, for example, revenue numbers, which of course is the main driver for a lot of stores, just not line up in between Universal and GA4. Things just don't seem right. Your last revenue numbers, which people actually live and die by, just seem a bit wonky and a bit skewed uh, when, when migrating to, to GA4. My question is, should people expect me metrics to line up kind of generally apples to apples with the migration? Or is it expected that something like an actual conversion, a revenue number, even basic you know, uh, acquisition metrics may not line up by the nature of the definition itself? Okay, I'm gonna give that super boring consulting answer. It, it. depends, but I'm gonna, make it, I'm gonna make it impactful. So it absolutely should line up for transactional type events. So if you have something like a purchase or you have a contact us form and like you're getting those at Salesforce, the number of conversions or transactional type events that should have similar counts okay. should align if you have done your implementation correctly. There'll always be a very slight variance, you know, of a few percentages just because of the way JavaScript and stuff works but those should very closely align. Where things might be different and it's expected for them to be different is some of the dimensions and metrics that you just mentioned, Ash, like sessions and users, 
we're going to see some variance there just because of the way things have changed. And I'll give you an example. In Universal Analytics, a session, I have this member, I think I'm going to remember this for the next 40 years, how a session was defined. A session in the old version of Google Analytics only ended after 30 minutes of inactivity or at midnight or any time a new traffic source was introduced. So if you had a user doing like competitive research on your brand and they were, uh, for example, found you on Google Organic, also clicked on your paid ad by accident, also found an offer code and all did that within 30 minutes, that would actually be three separate sessions because it was three separate traffic sources. So a session also is another thing that never really kind of made the most amount of sense in the old version. So how does it work in GA4? So I'll go to a report with sessions. So let's look at our traffic acquisition report. Here's this fun dimension called sessions. And in sessions, this is very different. So a session no longer ends at midnight. Fun fact. Mm -hmm. Another fun fact a session no longer starts over when a new traffic source is introduced. So if a user is actually interacting with you with multiple traffic sources, GA4 actually treats it as a single session. So because of that, we should expect that sessions are going to be less in GA4 than they were in Universal because you could argue Universal was over counting them. So because of that, to try and close your question, some dimensions of metrics are going to be very different and others in GA4 should be very similar. And to bottom line that with transactions, transactional metrics, if implemented correctly, should more or less line up from yes. universal to GA4. And if they don't, then you need to do more digging because something, I mean, if it, if it doesn't sound right, then usually it means something isn't right. Gotcha. Totally fair. Appreciate that. We actually have quite a few questions. I'd love to kind of hop into a couple of these right now. And I have a few other ones that are triaged. Um, yeah, on that. Um, let's start here. Also, real quick on the events page, <laughs> what was the the, uh, the 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 three monkey faces event? Because that was really important. Oh, so I'm a huge fan of emojis. Uh, I think they're very important. So when I set up my GA4, I tried to use emojis all over. You can see them in my account name. I have them in here. So it's just a fun feature that GA4 allows you to use emojis in a variety of places. So Love that's what I did. Good stuff. Brandon, I got you there. All right, let's hop in a couple of these questions here. So the first one that I'm seeing here how good is GA4 in tracking from a WordPress site for the education page to a Shopify site for a purchase page to some merchant software that processes the payment and so on? So let's talk about kind of hopping domains and platforms here. Okay. So I would say it's the same as Universal, where if it's all on a single domain, it's going to be very easy. So if it's all on, let's say, GoPro.com, and each one of those is a different directory. As long as you use the same tracking code, everything stitches together. Where things get more complicated because of reasons and the way the internet works is if it's on different top level domains. So if they go from GoPro to PayPal.com or something like that, things get a little bit more challenging and difficult. And that's where GA4 and Universal both have a cross domain tracking feature. And GA4 tried to simplify cross-domain tracking. So in theory, it should be easier to do. So um, my answer to that question would be, hopefully the experience is going to be GA4 is going to provide an easier way to link everything together properly. Gotcha. Thank you for that. Uh, the next question here, I'm going to reframe it a little bit, but will GA4 have better metrics for time on site and percentage of pages viewed? I think better might be the question mark here, will it have different kinds of metrics and what what you should expect from universal to GA4? Yeah. So that kind of goes back to what we talked about before about how GA4 measures time. So they rebuilt time as what they call engaged sessions or our engagement time. So I think in many ways, the engagement time is a superior metric to the time on site we had. Uh, engaged sessions, which is like the new version of bounce rate, I don't know if I've made a decision if I like this more or less than universal. Uh, the way the new kind of bounce rate works, there's actually a bounce rate in GA4. It's the inverse of engaged sessions. 
but it's defined as a number of sessions that had more than 10 seconds or two pages or conversion. Um, this is a better default definition, but I feel like Universal was more flexible with um, how you could customize bounce rate. You can't really customize engaged sessions as much. So I think the huge improvement here to your question is engagement time should be a lot more accurate because it's not measuring that idle time, which could, which could bloat or wildly inflate time in the old version. Totally fair. And I feel like, I mean, personal opinion, that level of customization actually added a bit more confusion sometimes, kind of depending on when you look at the report and how you were trying to do your overall analysis too. And Ash, this actually brings up a, a fun feature of GA4 to highlight. So cool. previously in Universal, you couldn't customize the reports at all. So everything you saw in the standard reports was what everyone saw at all times forever. There was no customization of those standard reports. In GA4, Google's actually allowed us to completely customize this. And let me give you a simple, silly example. I have a sandbox here. And in this sandbox, uh, hopefully some of you saw that show real quick. In this sandbox, let me try and go back. It went away for some reason. In this sandbox, look at my left-hand nav. It looks a lot different. I've got Rick's, Rick's reports about cats. I've got a life cycle. I created a set of reports here where I don't want Rick to ever uh, log in or look at these. So how did we do this? Well, in GA4, Google built a library where you can curate your own reports for the left-hand nav for all of your users. So if you don't like a metric and you actually want to bring in bounce rates or bring in conversions in a different way, you can fully kind of customize the default reports in GA4 and come in here and drag and remove or change the visualizations and then publish those. And my hope is, I think it would be so incredibly powerful if Google would, uh, would release a new feature to let us curate this for different groups of users. Imagine if your SEO team logged into GA4 and there was a bunch of SEO reports or your paid media team logged in and now everything's about paid media. So I'm hopeful that Google will re release new functionality here to let us take this even further. But I think this is another fun way uh, for that time question to start showcasing how you can customize GA4 around it. Definitely. Rick, man, total troublemaker. That's me. Um, <laughs> Thank you. Don't let Rick in, I'm telling you. I really hope there isn't a Rick here today, but if so, I'm sorry, Rick. Um, Couple of things here. So this came up a little bit. I'm going to ask it a bit more directly, just to kind of give some more, some more assurances here. But the question is, I'm having issues with GA4 not attributing revenue correctly. Revenue I know is email revenue based on data from my own email marketing platform, but GA4 attributes it to direct traffic. How do I fix this? And in addition to that, revenue reported in GA4 is just not accurate at all compared to Universal. So everything based on what you said, Charles, sounds like this might be an issue with the way it's actually deployed and implemented. Is, that, is yep. that right? So the classic way is to do kind of the audit trail and start from the beginning and then expand. So first of all, revenue should match your backend systems somewhat closely. And if it doesn't, we should be able to explain why it's not, right? If we're tracking every user, then it should match. If we have a consent management platform and we're letting users opt out, then obviously we're gonna start having some differences. We can restore that with consent mode or behavioral modeling or uh, other kind of alternative methods potentially as well. So first of all, you have to get the top line metric to be accurate. It sounds like that isn't, so that's where you should start. Secondly, from an acquisition perspective, we should also start to see some alignment. So the first place to start is obviously we need to look at the UTM codes, make sure it's uh, appearing on the website, and then GA4 is ingesting it. There's, if I switch over to Google Tag Manager for a second, uh, tagmanager.google.com, I'll tell you one of the most common implementation issues that I run across. And this might be what's causing your issue. So in um, GA4, Google has basically changed the implementation so that when you install GA4, there's two tag types. So if I go to create a tag, notice in GA4, there's a config tag and then there's an event tag. The config tag is supposed to be your global tag that goes on every page. 
And then event tags is what we use to track other things that happen after the page view. So this is basically your global page view tag, and this is our event tag. So ideally, right, we have our page view tag, and then if you're tracking a transaction, you'd use an event tag to do that. The config tag always has to fire first. If you accidentally set these up and you're not using conditions where you're making the config tag fire before the event, then that's where things could go wrong and your traffic might go to direct instead of the others. So just look at sequences or timing. I bet you have a race condition where sometimes the event fires before the config or something else. That's one of the most classic implementation issues that we've seen with GA4. Uh, and that's where I would take a look and make sure that you've done. Gotcha. Actually, while you're on Tag Manager, by the way, yes. it's fair to say that as people do this migration and move over, Tag Manager should theoretically make this a lot easier for them. Uh, if you have Google Tag Manager already installed, you can do some of the GA4 migration in like a matter of minutes because like if you just want to page use, right? You just use the new uh, config tag and you have page views running and you deploy it. So that's the beauty is Google Tag Manager does make the migrations a heck of a lot simpler. Gotcha. Very cool. All right. A few more questions here. Um, all with a really similar theme. It's kind of nice to know that this is on the, you know, it's, it's a constant thing on people's minds right now. Um, one of them is, do you need to create GTM tags and triggers for funnels to work? Absolutely not. So let's go through a simple example. So if I go to, I'll show you how a real funnel works since the one I showed was a very poor demo. So let's say we want to build a funnel. I'm oh, sorry, I should have built one from scratch. Let's build a funnel from scratch. So we're going to go in here. We're going to select our funnel technique. And now we have a blank canvas. So all we need to do is define our steps. So let's do that contact example. So first I'm going to do a page location. We'll add a filter and I'll say step one is I want to look at anyone who viewed my blog. Uh, step two is we want to look at next anyone that went to our contact page. So this will be a super simple two-step funnel. If anyone on here is from Google, could, I would love for the drop down not to cover the apply button. That would be my dream feature. <laughs> so here's my two-step funnel. Always remember to give them a name so it doesn't just call this new step. Hit apply and watch what happens. The funnel is fully retroactive. I can zoom in so it actually shows a little bit of blue on here. But we can see this. We have our drop-offs. We can build segments. We can share those with ads to do remarketing. We can do all our analysis. And in fact, there's a brand new feature here. Look at this button up here. If you click this folder in the top right-hand corner, it actually will add this funnel to a standard reports so all of your users can have access to this. So there, Google's now letting us actually publish Explore reports Amazing. and standard reports, so some advanced functionality. So funnels do not require new tags. They're completely retroactive. And as long as you're capturing the data, you have access to all your dimensions and metrics to create these on the fly. That's super powerful and infinitely easier from when I was there too. That is very cool. Yes. Charles, half step back, uh, follow up to the last question on revenue may not line, you know, be lining up from GA4 Universal. Um, so the question is, so to be clear, the configuration tag should be implemented first and on every page, and then events only tag on pages where an event would happen. Is that correct? Yeah, I was going to see if I can find an example. I don't know if I'm going to have a good one. No but worries. essentially, sequence, this is how you learn everything about Google Analytics. Sequence GA4 config. So if we just Google for some help, we usually end up on CMOS blogs. So, <laughs> um, I don't know. I'm not going to find it now. But there's a feature in Google Tag Manager called Sequences where if you want something to fire before another tag, you basically can sequence it. So it always ensures that it fires second. So to be clear, you just need to edit the firing rules so that you put some logic to delay any of your event tags to fire after the config tag loads. And that ensures the config tag fires all of the uh, kind of admin settings that you've defined into all of your additional tags. So it can be a bit confusing at first, but I think the sequence is the key part there. You just need to always ensure you sequence them properly. Awesome. 
Carissa, hopefully that was uh, that was helpful. Um, real quick, I'm getting a couple of texts here now too. I think I've got some friends here uh, watching us today too. Can we talk about Shopify real quick? I think a lot of folks here uh, do work in e-commerce. Uh, this is very front of mind, but at a high level, how compatible is GA4 with Shopify? Um, currently, it's not a, it's, it's not a built-in integration, so is the right method to use Tag Manager and deploy it that way? I've, I've never received a text during a live webinar, so <laughs> I feel like you're on another level than me. Um, so for Shopify, uh, Shopify, I think, again, if we just do some Googling, they just announced their GA4 uh, integration. So this just went live, I think, maybe two months ago, if I recall correctly. So if you're on a Shopify instance, step one is see if you can use this official integration. If for some reason this isn't working out, there is another um, company, I think it's called Elevar. And Elevar basically has like GTM templates. Uh, and they also have server-side integrations as well. So if you want to get into advanced GA4 uh, configurations, I think almost everyone uses like Elevar uh, or something similar to customize that. So those would be the two options for Shopify. Amazing. Can I just mention, by the way, that I love that no matter what career I've actually gone down, what path, the answer is always like, I'll just Google it and figure out what Google says for an answer. And basically, as I was saying, it was a technical question about GTM or any of that. We just go to SEMO and anything else, we go to Google. I love it. SEMO is incredible. Um, this is kind of a tangential question, still for Shopify store owners, but for those that haven't started the migration yet, naturally get started now, right? The deadline is coming up or data collection will in fact stop on the old snippet. But how do people think about with GA4, what, what's the best way to think about building audiences, reporting, et cetera, for use of Google marketing platform and other 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 ad platforms? What's, what's, what's the right way to kind of think about it conceptually? Yeah, I really wish Google would do some more marketing emails or like in product notifications to let us know the product's deprecating. That, that was my attempt at sarcasm for, for any of you. Um, so if for some reason you haven't started your GA4 migration, you're in trouble, you're already behind, and your life is going to be difficult for a while, it's not the end of the world. It's just the problem is when you're doing analysis, um, GA4 only works point in time forward. So ideally for any analyst, we always want 13 months of data. So we could do month over month and year over year reporting. And that means now you have to wait uh, that many more months until we have year over year available in GA4. So my recommendation is always just start small and get started. And it's extremely easy. What you should always do is you just start, and I, I showed you this in Google Tag Manager. Just start today, go deploy the config tag and get your page views in place. Next, get your conversions. And then lastly, focus on all the rest of your events and you can do that at your own time. Once you have that done, you can go in GA4 and you can start recreating the audiences and the other piece. And depending on how complex your implementation is, you could do it all in a day, or it might take you a few weeks or even months to do if you're kind of more of an enterprise. Sure. Um, but for a lot of you on the smaller side, it's not that hard. There's lots of tutorials and guides to get started. I think if you just YouTube a GA4 workshop in my name, I actually have a full like simple demo where I go through everything to do that deployment. And I know many of my friends do as well. Um, so that would be my recommendation to get started. Just don't wait, do something. It's a good reminder, man, that your insight's only as good as how much accurate data you have, right? So yes, I believe it is July 1st, correct? That everything switches over? For the free version, yeah. If you're on the 360 version, you kind of have another year. But for all of our friends on the free version of Universal, you basically have, what, 22 more days. Gotcha. I'm seeing a couple of questions here around the fact that, uh, correctly, people are usually comparing last year's month to this year's month, kind of trying to understand seasonality and build a better profile and picture of current audiences and customers. What happens with historical data and the old reporting with this change? So Google just uh, updated their support article. Uh, I think they updated it like in the last two weeks. So I think there's, if I remember correctly, you can continue to go to your old version. So if I go to my old version, you can access this for another year. Um, and then 
after a year, I think they're going to start deprecating it and removing your access. So if you still want access after a year from now, you need to download that data somehow, like through a spreadsheet or some of the exports that are available in the UI. Um, but the, I guess, simple answer to your question is there's not really a great way. Um, the ideal way, and it's too late to do this now if you haven't started, but was to run them both side by side. Um, mm. And that way you'd have a year of data today. So if you started early, just don't use your old data. You already have enough in the new version and you're good to go. If you haven't, then you either are likely just going to do what I did. You just need to switch to your old instance, switch to your new instance. Perhaps with Data Studio, you could create some joins or bridges uh, since you can connect to both, but it's not going to be easy. And that's just the reality of it. Gotcha. So you know, by the way, that telling people not use their old data is going to be a little anxiety inducing, but it's all going to be okay, right? Honestly, like uh, I think the best answer is just rip the Band-Aid off, struggle. It's going to be some pain, but <laughs> holding on to the old version is just not really going to do any, any good in the long run. Yeah, here um, you. If you're on the 360 version, I'll give you a different answer. You can still use it since we can still collect data. But if you're on the free version, yeah, we got to rip that Band-Aid off and, and just start getting immersed in GA4. Um, there's not really a, a better way to do it. It's a it's a great takeaway, man. Um, team, a couple of questions left, and then I'd love to kind of wrap up with some some key takeaways to keep in mind. And of course, we're always available for for questions and connecting after uh, after the session as well. Um, the, 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 this is really interesting. It's actually one I get quite a bit. But the question is, I'm looking to audit my website on most important metrics. What section on the left hand side do you recommend to use, and which metrics? Things like bounce rate, time on site, engagement. Is there anything you guys suggest that would benefit improving our website experience and which pages are performing the best? So if you want to do an audit, um, I'll try and zoom in so you can all see this. Dana, one of my uh, friends, took an audit template that I built for Data Studio and created a GA4 version. So my first recommendation would be to go grab her free kind of audit template and take a look at that. Um, and that would be probably the easiest way to go. Other than that, really in the UI, if you want to do it manually, it's just kind of the common sense stuff, right? We got to make sure our events are right. It's matching with our backend. If we're sending out marketing emails and we're tracking engagement that we're somewhat directionally capturing the same data in GA. And we're doing that for obviously for attribution, sources, conversions. Um, but it's the same stuff we've always done in Universal. We're just looking at different places. There's sure. not one place to look in GA4. You still need to look in lots of places to do an audit effectively. And that's why I think this kind of audit template is going to be really interesting for you to, to, to explore. Dana's incredible. And thank you for making that template too. Um, this going to be super helpful for anyone in the migration. Um, all right. Uh, let's talk about PII real quick. Considering PII information that is not auto-collected automatically in GA4, only data layer variables set in GA4 event parameters in Google Tag Manager are sent, correct? So let's, I'll show you a fun feature that Google hasn't announced, but right. we found. So if we go in the admin, this is the GA demo account. And in here, if we go into their data streams and I click on the merchandise store, check out this new feature called redact data. Mm. So it's not available. It hasn't rolled out. This is just uh, added to the demo account. So it's a taste of what might come to Google Analytics. But here it allows you to basically come in and strip uh, different parameters or PII from the GA4 UI um, and remove it. So if you're worried about PII, this upcoming feature might help you. Otherwise, Google Tag Manager offers a ton of possibilities. And if we go back to our friend Simo, if you're using server side as well, uh, there's actually a new feature that was announced yesterday called Transformations, which offers even more control over it as well. So those are the three areas I'd explore to remove PII. And if for whatever reason you've accidentally captured PII within your Google Analytics, Google has also uh, greatly improved the data deletion tools that are in here. I don't remember where it is. It's somewhere in here. Uh, but we have a lot more powerful data deletion tools in the UI to delete data when we need it. Love it, man. That is incredibly powerful, something that we'd asked for 
back in my tenure over there too. Um, yeah, my merch store. I think we got quite a bit of the uh, of the bulk of questions here answered. Um, hopefully that was uh, that was helpful, everybody. I'd like to wrap up with a couple of key takeaways, if you don't mind, if I can uh, steal the screen real quick, Charles. Yeah, go for it. All right. So uh, I'm gonna steal. I'm gonna steal uh, a little bit of your thunder, but one key takeaway. Please get started on the migration now if you haven't already. Save yourself some pain. It's a new world. It's a new future. Start the migration now. Tag Manager will definitely help. Charles can certainly help over that sort of as well. But if you haven't started yet, please get started now. It, 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 it's a good weekend project just to make sure that everything's migrated correctly because you can't make good decisions off of bad or incomplete data. But that aside, Charles, what would you say the main takeaways are for you, for anyone that is thinking about one, getting started, and two, how to make sense of all this madness. Yep, so getting started is not as hard as you think. Just get the basic tag in place and you'll get some data to play with. Uh, if you already have GA4 in place, um, I think ripping the Band-Aid off and really just trying to use GA4 and uh, to be transparent, like it's not all perfect. There's still lots of things we have to solve, but Google's actually made some fantastic options. There's a free BigQuery connector that BigQuery connector was another feature that cost $150,000 to get access to. Everyone mm -hmm. has access to it for free. And that's going to power a lot of the things that AI Adaptive and other uh, 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 companies can do to take GA4 to a whole other level. So use that BigQuery connector um, and then uh, Looker Studio or anything on top to solve some of those pain points. And lastly, uh, just find some resources on Twitter or LinkedIn. There's lots of experts like Krista, uh, Dana, and others to get the latest on GA4. It should be a, a, a fast and furious kind of 12 to 24 months. Uh, Google's going to release a lot of new stuff, tweaks, features, all sorts of stuff. Um, so you also just need to pay attention. Amazing. Thanks, buddy. It's been a fun hour to spend with you so far. Um, Nate Nuzo, I do see you in here, by the way. I'm sure you recognize that video behind me. You can text me a little bit later. The last text I got, by the way, Charles, which was live, is the exact same question that you asked me when we're in the waiting room, which is, no, this is not Albert Einstein. Uh, this is my puppy, Loki, and maybe in the next webinar, he will make an appearance. Uh, Ash, Ash also promised for our next webinar, he'll do a live Peloton uh, moderation, too. So. Oh, yeah. Of that. No one wants to see that. This is not a good look. Everyone, we're always here to help. Thank you for spending time with us today. Hope it was helpful. The recording will get sent out. Uh, if you guys need to reach us at all, um, for me, if you want to talk about measurement, data, shoot the shit, uh, talk about maybe supercharging your answer, your 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 your, your sales uh, on your on your on your website. Uh, my name is Ash. I work at Adaptive. Uh, my buddy Charles here is the genius, is the head of innovation here at AdSwerve. You can reach us both right here, Twitter, LinkedIn, email, whatever works. But have a wonderful week. It's all going to be okay. Deep breaths, and let's get after it. All right. Talk soon. See you guys.